The Where Our Minds Wanda podcast may contain sensitive content and explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Greetings, fellow wanderers, to the places our minds wander. Where strange lights speed beyond reason across a clear night sky. The house at the end of the road, where disembodied voices whisper, and strange noises make the living shiver. Lurking shadows hiding on the edge of the woods, just outside your back door. Odd, true events throughout time that lead you down the rabbit hole. I'm Wes. And I'm Beth. And this is where our minds wander. Hello and welcome to Where Our Minds Wander, all you fellow wanderers. I'm Wes, and that's my wife and co-host, Beth. Hello, everyone. And each week we delve into stories that piqued our curiosity. They might be about cryptids or UFO encounters or hauntings, pretty much anything supernatural or paranormal. But we also cover anything strange and unusual that we find interesting, like morbid history or unsolved mysteries. Yeah, and don't forget to check out our website, whereourmindswander.com, or our Facebook page at Where Our Minds Wander. We have a couple good stories for tonight's episode, so everyone get comfy, and let's see where Wes's mind wandered this week. Well, I think all of you are going to enjoy this one tonight. I found this story really intriguing and a bit gross, but I'll let all you wanders decide for yourselves. In 1798, a young Prussian soldier named Charles Domery was captured by the British. On September 17, 1799, the same soldier, Charles Domery, was the subject of a rather alarming and disturbing experiment. At 4 a.m., Charles was woken up and fed four pounds of raw cow's udder. At 9.30 a.m., he was given five pounds of raw beef to eat, followed by 12 tallow candles that equaled a pound, and a bottle of beer. He was able to consume all of it in under an hour. At 1 p.m., he was given another five pounds of raw beef, another pound of tallow candles, and three large bottles of beer. Charles happily consumed it all. They made him eat 14 pounds of raw meat and two pounds of candles? Yes, they did. Jeez. You see, this experiment wasn't a form of torture, although it certainly sounds like one. It does to me. The experiment was actually a bona fide attempt to figure out what exactly was going on with this soldier. The soldier, Charles Domery, was the man who could eat anything. Charles Domery was born in Poland in 1778. An insatiable, voracious hunger seemed to run in his family. All eight of his brothers and his father just couldn't get enough food, and for whatever reason, they preferred their meat mostly raw. At the tender age of 13, Charles joined the Prussian army and immediately began to complain about the lack of food. But here's the thing. He was being fed. Each soldier received the same amount of daily rations, but it just wasn't enough for him. So hearing that the French fed their soldiers more, Charles found his way into Fionville and surrendered to the French commander, effectively switching sides. <laughs> wow. Just for more food? Yes. As a reward, the French commander gave Charles a melon, which he devoured right there and then, rind and all. Charles joined the French Revolutionary Army, hoping to feel full. To their credit, the French army gave him double rations each day. But it still wasn't enough, especially since they boiled their meat. And each time Charles tried to eat it, it made him sick. Unbelievably hungry, Charles did what he had to do in order to stop his aching, growling stomach. Now, what I'm about to tell you might be a little disturbing, so be forewarned. Oh, boy. At a camp near Paris, Charles reportedly ate 174 cats in a single year. Oh, no. Now, he wasn't some sadistic cat hater. He didn't have some sort of mental health issue either. In fact, 
By all accounts, he looked like a normal man, although he was quite tall for the time at about six foot three. His skin was smooth, and he had soft gray eyes and long brown hair, and eating the cats really, really bothered him emotionally. A fellow soldier was recorded as saying that Charles would appear completely distraught and anguished each time he killed a cat in order to eat it. But when he was particularly famished, he didn't always kill them first. Ah, oh, that sounds like a horror movie. When he couldn't find a cat, or the idea of killing one was just too much for him, he'd gorge himself on grass. Now, here's the thing. No one ever witnessed him vomiting afterwards. Even after eating grass? No. And they never saw him urinating or defecating. It was as if he consumed copious amounts of food, and it just went nowhere. There's even one nastier account of what Charles would eat. While on a ship during battle, a fellow soldier's leg was taken off by cannon fire. You can guess where I'm going with this. Oh, no. As you can imagine, his fellow soldiers were both amazed and disgusted by Charles. It was while he was on this ship, the Hoach, that Charles was captured by the British off the coast of Ireland in 1798. Back then, when prisoners of war were caught, their home army would pay for their rations. In Charles' case, he was given the daily ration of 26 ounces of bread, half a pound of vegetables, and either two ounces of butter or six ounces of cheese. While most soldiers didn't eat all of this or were sufficiently fed by this, Charles devoured it and was still painfully hungry. So his rations were doubled. When this still wasn't enough, the Brits raised his rations until he was eating the equivalent of 10 soldiers' rations a day. But that still wasn't enough, and Charles was known to catch stray rats that wandered into his cell and add them to his meal. Or the resident prison cat. Oh, no. He even ate candles. But the candles were for a slightly different reason. All this constant eating caused him throat irritation, and the candles acted as a sort of lubricant to get the food down. Wow. That had to be horrifying for everyone, including him. But that wasn't it. He would also eat any leftover medications in the prison infirmary, which didn't kill him, although you think it would. And when his daily beer rations were all gone, he'd resort to drinking water, which was really taking a risk. Water sources were infamously dangerous, and that's why the beer was the preferred beverage. Yes, like I said before, all this stuff, which you would think would make a normal person sick, or very possibly kill someone, didn't adversely affect Charles at all. Surprisingly enough, Charles had no intestinal issues, and he never threw up. In fact, the only time he did throw up was when he was given cooked meat. He never seemed to have any problems with the raw meat he consumed. He just couldn't get enough. The only effect his diet seemed to have on him was that every night after he went to bed, Charles would begin to sweat. A lot. It usually lasted about two hours. Then he'd fall asleep around 10 p.m. and wake up every night at 1 a.m., starving once again. He would eat whatever he could get his hands on, hence the rats and grass and candles. When he couldn't catch anything, he'd smoke tobacco. About an hour later, he would fall back asleep, and at around 5 a.m. or so, he'd wake up again, sweating profusely. Eventually, the prison commander stepped in, bringing Charles to the sick and hurt commissioners. There, a Dr. J. Johnston and a Dr. D. Cochran of the Royal College of Physicians at Edinburgh agreed that Charles needed to be studied. So now we're back to where I started my story. The two doctors decided to record exactly what they gave Charles to eat and exactly how it affected them. At 4 a.m., they woke him up and gave him the four pounds of raw cow's udder. He ate it willingly and happily. At 9.30 a.m., they gave him the five pounds of raw beef and the 12 tallow candles, as well as a bottle of beer. He consumed it all with no problem in under an hour. At 1 p.m., they repeated the 9.30 meal, 
adding two additional bottles of wine. It was noted that an hour later, he was quite jovial and content. He even danced. He didn't finish his third meal until close to 6 p.m., but he did it with no complaints. The doctors noted that during this almost 12-hour period, he didn't urinate or defecate or vomit, not once. His skin color was clear and cool, no redness or swelling, but then around 8 p.m., he smoked his pipe and drank yet another bottle of beer, and his sweating began once again. The doctors noted this carefully, and they also noted that despite his bizarre and seemingly unhealthy diet, Charles was able to perform physical tasks with ease, like marching and other work. So, what did they conclude? Well, nothing. They were completely baffled. And other than the medical records of the experiment, we have no idea what became of Charles Domery. No other documentation exists. In fact, very few people, if any, even remembered Charles Domery until 1852, when another Charles, this one named Charles Dickens, wrote about the insatiable soldier after reading about him. Other than that, Charles' story fell into obscurity for the most part. But of course, there are still those out there that wonder what exactly was wrong with him. There had to be some sort of medical reason for not just his condition, but his brother's and father's condition. Was it hereditary? Or was Charles' story exaggerated to the point of legend? Well, it is a fact that the medical records of Dr. Johnston and Dr. Cochrane do exist. They did examine Charles. Today, people wonder if Charles was suffering from hypothyroidism. If he was, then it was the most extreme case ever known to man. With hypothyroidism, people do have trouble sleeping, sweat a lot, and can eat without gaining weight. But the other symptoms like rapid heartbeat and mood swings just don't fit this case. By all accounts, Charles was a very likable, very jovial, very easygoing man, except when he was desperately in search of food. So perhaps he had polyphagia, also called hyperphagia, which is caused by undiagnosed diabetes. According to the Cleveland Clinic medical website, polyphagia is an extreme hunger that doesn't necessarily go away after eating, and excessive eating doesn't always result in any weight gain. It could have been undiagnosed diabetes that Charles was dealing with, except there are three common signs of diabetes, not just the polyphagia, but also polydipsia, which is extreme thirst, and polyuria, frequent urination. We know that from the medical reports that Charles didn't show any signs of either of those things. Right. They said that no one ever saw him going to the bathroom at all. Exactly. So perhaps this polyphagia was a sign of something else, like Graves' disease or insulinoma, which causes a person to have very, very low levels of insulin. It's possible that either of these could be the answer. Or perhaps he suffered from a damaged amygdala, which, when observed in animals, causes extreme hunger. Regardless, Charles Darmory is just one of a very, very few documented cases of such incredible out-of-control hunger, and although we can emphasize with him in a way, we should probably also be glad that this doesn't happen more often. Wow. Well, you were right. It was fascinating, and it was a little gross. You know, it, it kind of reminded me of Tartare or Tartare. The, he was the French guy who could eat anything. Well, a lot of sites mention them together, as the two most extreme and documented cases. Well, it was definitely extreme. Yeah, it's nothing, you know, I, I thought going out to some of these buffet places, you saw some pretty bizarre things <laughs> and how much you know, people could eat. But this takes the cake. For sure. Hey, did you know? In our government's most recently released report on UFOs, they made one thing clear. They aren't supposed to be called UFOs anymore. The new official term is UAP, or Unexplained Aerial Phenomenon. 
Furthermore, the government has acknowledged that UAPs most certainly exist. Is that because of the major increase in recent sightings? In 2022, the official reported number of UAPs was 144, while the 2023 report covers 247. Although labeled as UAPs, the government's explanation for the majority of them still seems to be weather balloons, drones, and plastic bags. Who'd have thunk it? Well, I'd have thunk it. The government has their heads up their butts. <laughs> plastic bags. It's like the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Right. <laughs> Especially since we can't have plastic bags anymore. <laughs> So, where did your mind wander for this week's episode? Well, a while back, I talked about why black cats became a symbol for Halloween and the various myths and beliefs tied to black cats. And for a while now, I've been thinking about a horror movie staple and why this particular object shows up in so many scary movies to the point that it's become pretty cliché. Those of us who like horror movies have all seen this cliché. At some point, some character reveals a small cloth doll, maybe with unnerving button eyes, and the person fills themselves with bad intentions before sticking a pin into the doll's arm or leg. Then the scene cuts to some unsuspecting character doubling over in pain. I know where you're going with this. Or Children stumble upon a metal box down in an old root cellar, and when they open it, they find a cloth doll covered in cobwebs. When they bring it up into the house, maybe they hide it in their bedroom closet or under their bed, instant evil begins tormenting the family. At some point in the narrative, we may even see flashbacks of a voodoo priestess cursing this doll. I mean... Just this past Friday night, we watched the newest Jeepers Creepers movie, and when one of the characters picked up a voodoo doll, I smirked a little like, there it is, mostly because there was very little reason for there to even be a voodoo doll in the scene. But because it was there, we just keep believing that voodoo dolls are bad. And if you probably didn't already realize it. The newest Jeeper Keepers Reborn was completely awful. (laughs) Just to put that out there. So I've been wondering for a while now just what the history is behind voodoo dolls and if they've always been used with ill intentions. I'll admit that I thought there must be some grain of truth to voodoo dolls being tied to black magic. But once I really started to look at the origin of the dolls and how they are actually used in voodoo, it just became abundantly clear to me that Hollywood has perpetuated the stereotype and propaganda surrounding voodoo dolls since the very beginning. No way. Hollywood perpetuating things? (laughs) Say it isn't so. (laughs) And the way that... Voodoo dolls have been mass produced and sold in like Halloween themed stores and as tourist knickknacks doesn't really help. Well, I noticed the other day when we were at one of our local shops that they had a variety of voodoo dolls. Some of them were even made into keychains, I guess probably because they were, you know, for the people who can't wait to get home when something goes wrong and they want to stick needles into them right away. <laughs> well, As I was looking into this, I found it all really interesting. So that's what I'm going to talk about tonight, the truth about voodoo dolls. People have been crafting figurines for thousands of years. Just look at any of the ancient cultures, from China to Mesopotamia to Greece to Egypt. Quite often, the figurines represented their gods or deities, and they were placed in homes or in places of worship or they were put into burial chambers. But there were also times when figurines or even statues were cursed by the living. 
For example, in ancient Greece, it was possible to perform a binding ritual on a statue that was meant to represent your enemy. At first, this binding only happened in their myths between one god and another, but then it began to be used in daily life by real people, too. Generally, the statues were literally bound in chains and then attached to the earth in order to ward off threats of attack by invading armies. The statue would represent the enemy army, and by binding it, the army would lose their power to attack. The ancient Egyptians made little figurines of their enemies out of wax. Then they would melt them or break them to symbolically represent their defeat. Clay and stone examples have been found as well some meant to represent a single person, and some representing an entire group or nation. And these are inscribed with curses. So the ancient Egyptians would burn wax effigies of hostile gods or human enemies. They'd create pottery or stone vessels to represent enemies and destroy them. And they'd create human-shaped figurines that they'd bury in temples. But cultures in both North and South America have their own versions of voodoo dolls used for positive purposes. For example, the worry dolls of Guatemala, which originated with the Mayans. I had some of these when I was a kid, although I don't remember where I got them from. But you can find them in stores all over the U.S. They're those little tiny, tiny miniature dolls that have like bright fabric wrapped around them. And the ones that I had were made out of tiny little bits of square toothpicks, and they had tiny scraps of bright fabric tied on them. Um, If I held my hand out, I could probably, as an adult, hold like 20 or 30 of them in the palm of my hand. Yeah, I've seen those before. Hmm. Worry dolls were given to children. They are supposed to think of whatever worries they had or whatever they were afraid of and then put the dolls under their pillow to help chase those fears away. So it's pretty much like giving them just a stuffed animal to sleep with. Yeah, it's the same exact idea. It's like a comfort thing. Right. In Arizona, the Hopi tribe have Kachina dolls. They were also meant for children, but they weren't meant to be played with. They were given to children as a representation of a specific spirit and then hung on the wall And the children learned about the specific deity and the spirits by studying the dolls. And there was nothing evil or negative about worry dolls or kachina dolls. So, like I said, the idea of what are essentially voodoo dolls crosses several cultures all over the world, even if they're called different names. So why are voodoo dolls always portrayed as evil in movies? Well. Because they're based in New Orleans voodoo. Right, which is also generally portrayed as evil or black magic in movies. Right. So, from the beginning, when enslaved Africans were brought to Haiti to work the plantations, a 1685 law made practicing their own religion illegal, and all, quote, masters, were required to convert their enslaved workers to Christianity within eight days of their arrival. Wow, they didn't give them much time, did they? No. Many enslaved people merged their own beliefs with this forced Christianity, and they were able to relate some of their own Iwas, or spirits, to the Christian saints. For example, they were willing to think of the Iwa, or spirit, of Papa Legba as St. Peter. After the Haitian Revolution in 1791, many French colonists came to New Orleans, Louisiana, bringing enslaved people with them. The Haitian Revolution was a big deal. It made white colonists incredibly nervous. And one way to ensure that it didn't happen again was to demonize their voodoo religion. Books were even written falsely stating that voodoo practitioners committed human sacrifices and cannibalism. Colonists zeroed in on the voodoo belief of a universal energy and that the soul is free to leave the physical body during dreams and spirit possession. As you can imagine, 
This entire idea was considered demonic by colonial Christians. Any spirit possession had to be evil. Many of them struggled to comprehend that a spirit possession could be welcomed because it allowed people to connect with positive energy, which is what practitioners of voodoo are doing. See, they believe in one extremely powerful God, and the only way to communicate with that God is through the spirits of those who have already passed on. It seems reasonable, at least to me, that most humans are not all good or all bad. We all have varying degrees of both inside of us at all times. And voodoo allowed people to connect to good energy. But since the Christian church believed that all possessions were evil, then what the voodoo practitioners were doing had to be evil too. But of course. But anyway, part of connecting to the spirit world in voodoo involves performing all kinds of rituals, just like they do in indigenous tribes in this country, like the Hopi. Voodoo rituals often require an object called a puen. Puen can be all kinds of things, but frequently they are dolls. They usually have something physically attached to them that a specific spirit, or Iwa, would like, so that a person can attract that specific spirit to help them with whatever they are trying to accomplish. And since the spirit or spirits they are connecting to are good energy, the voodoo doll is used mainly for positive reasons, with positive intentions. For example, a voodoo doll can be used to heal loved ones. Yes, a a person might pin a lock of hair to a doll or something else that belonged to a specific loved one, but that's how the spirit world knows who the healing energy is for. Then they place the doll between a blue and white candle, but not really out in the open. Voodoo dolls are hidden from plain sight because the person it is meant for might not want the help and they might willingly sever the energy linked to it. And I think that might be another part of why voodoo dolls are seen as negative in movies, because they're often hidden. And for someone who doesn't know the true intention behind it, if they find a doll with, like, their hair pinned to it, surrounded by candles, hidden out of sight, it makes for a tense plot point. Yeah, exactly. In other instances, a specific type of voodoo doll might be created by a witch doctor or a voodoo queen called a minkisi. These are made out of wood and have a little pouch built into the stomach area, or the pouch is hung around the doll's neck. This pocket or pouch is meant to hold medicine put there by a qualified healer that should help heal the person who is sick or injured. The medicine themselves were symbolic. They might be a stone from a graveyard or herbs or animal bones. Once the sickness goes away or the injury heals, the medicine is removed from the pouch and the voodoo doll just becomes a doll. The spiritual power is in the medicine, not the doll itself. So removing the medicine removes the spiritual connection. So... Really, the voodoo doll is just a container of sorts. Yeah, it's like a, exactly. I was going to say a vessel, but yeah, exactly. Right. Besides healing, voodoo dolls can be used for all kinds of positive intentions. For example, attaching rose petals to a voodoo doll can help with love, and garlic or clover can bring luck. A puen can be asked for help in a long journey, requesting safe travels or good weather. Or maybe you want to have clear focus or better focus on a specific problem in your life. A voodoo doll as a puen might help you do that. They are used specifically to help guide someone or heal someone or protect someone. And they can be used in other ways, too. When voodoo dolls are hung in the trees in cemeteries, They're meant to act as a line of communication between the living and the recently deceased. You know how, it's kind of a cliche, but you know how when people break up with someone, they might 
throw all the stuff that the person left behind in their house, like a shirt or a toothbrush or, you know, just all that stuff. They might throw it in like a little garbage can and then light it on fire. Right. (laughs) Or when people get photographs and they cut their exes out of the photographs or, well, I guess today they would just delete them off their phones. (laughs) Exactly. But, (laughs) I mean, we do these little rituals to just like cleanse ourselves from the toxic relationship or we might use it as an act of closure. Well, in voodoo, if you tack a doll upside down on a tree in a cemetery, that's their way of spiritually ending a relationship that was toxic to them. Not because they wish the other person harm, but because they are symbolically severing their ties with someone who has harmed them, and they are trying to stop caring for the person who has hurt them or was bad for them. But, I mean, I was thinking about that. And to be honest, if I've never been to New Orleans, but if I had been to New Orleans before researching this and I had seen a voodoo doll tacked upside down, on a tree in a cemetery, I think I would have found it a little creepy because somewhere in my cultural grooming, I learned that voodoo dolls are not good. Like, run away. They're not good. Right. I pretty much just think it was some silly kids out, you know, trying to scare people. Well, I'm just really glad that I looked into it because I learned some things. I mean, mostly I was clueless about voodoo dolls, but at least I'm a little less clueless now. Really now. So if, you know, when we're out for one of our jaunts in the local cemeteries and you see one now in a tree hanging upside down, you're going to be okay with it? Well, (laughs) I think if that happened, it would fall into one of three possible categories, right? Like I think, one, it could be an authentic voodoo doll that someone put there with good intentions. or Like you said, it could be some kids who are playing a prank and trying to scare people. Or it could be someone with negative intentions who base their actions on what they've seen in movies. More than likely, yes. So, I mean, it would boil down to intent. And if you can't ask the person, then you don't know what their intent is. But if it was done with bad intentions, then that's just disrespectful. So, you know, it's funny because growing up, Every movie that I saw that had voodoo in it, I always thought was pretty hokey. I never bought into any of it. I always thought it was a complete joke, how they they always tried to like, ooh, it's a scary thing. It never seemed that scary to me. But I can see where, for some, where it would. Well, I think it depends on on what your religious beliefs are, too. Yeah, probably. So... In voodoo, once the goal of that upside-down doll is achieved, the voodoo doll loses its tie to the spirit world completely, and it just becomes a doll, nothing more. It doesn't retain energy or continue to be any source of power. It's not cursed. It's just a doll. So I tried to find where the whole idea of a voodoo doll being stuck with pins comes from. And I couldn't really find an answer to that, although it is the first image that most people think of when they hear voodoo doll. So I think it may have something to do with the propaganda and the early colonists' attempt to equate voodoo with black magic. And it didn't help that in the 1950s, a type of doll from Haiti became really popular when it was imported into the U.S. The dolls were purely decorative. They weren't meant to be played with. And they were covered in cashew shells and castor beans. And they called them cashew dolls because of it. But children did get a hold of them and play with them and eat the beans off of them. And unfortunately, the beans were lethal. Oh, no. And these cashew dolls were mistakenly called voodoo dolls in their marketing and in statements issued by the U.S. government. So that kind of cemented the tie between voodoo dolls and the death of children in public sentiment. I've never seen those before. I never even heard about them. 
they're very different looking. Like if you look at pictures online, they don't look anything like what a traditional voodoo doll looks like. And I couldn't help thinking that there was a tie between this and tarot cards, too, because it's the same with tarot cards in movies. Like, right. How many movies have we seen where they go to a tarot card reader and they pull the death card and then they announce that someone's going to die, right? Exactly. <laughs> and it wasn't until I started buying my own decks and studying them that I realized that that's not what the death card even means. It's That's not what it means at all. No, not at all. And we have enough tarot card decks to start our own store. <laughs> But it's definitely portrayed that way in movies. So I think those are two things that that are not portrayed accurately. So, like I said, I did learn a lot. And I can see how people who practice other religions might still be wary of voodoo dolls. Um, but I do think it's important to question why we have certain cliches and tropes in the movies that we watch and the books that we read just so that we have the full picture and not just one perspective. And I think maybe it's about time our movie stopped perpetuating the negative and possibly very inaccurate depiction of voodoo dolls. Well, that's never going to happen. <laughs> you mean they're not all going to listen to this and then agree with me instantaneously? <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, well. <laughs> but I liked your story. Well, thanks. <laughs> well, I guess that about wraps it up for this episode. Uh, we hope you all enjoyed it. And we hope to see you all next week for an all new episode of Where Minds Wander. See you next week. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to traveling with you again to the places where our minds wander. If you like what you heard, please take a moment and provide us with a five-star rating and a comment on your favorite listening platform. It really helps us move up the list and become more visible on the podcast charts so new people can find us. Thank you all for your continued support. See you all next week for an all-new episode of Where Our Minds Wander.